You've more than likely learned in school about the Cuban Missile Crisis, often touted as the closest the Cold War ever came to evolving into World War III. For 13 days in 1962, the U.S. blocked submarines that were suspected of being armed with nuclear weapons on their way to Cuba. In schools, teachers were telling their students what to do if nukes were set off in nearby cities. People were generally preparing for the end of civilization. Awkward miscommunications between the White House and the Kremlin kept making things worse and worse. Firebrands railed about how we should be striking the Soviets preemptively before they had a chance to set up nukes in Cuba that would be capable of hitting U.S. cities. Although we would later learn that we were very much not stopping the first shipment of nukes to Cuba, and they were very much already there. But here's the thing you might not know. We came a lot closer to the actual reality of nuclear annihilation in those 13 days than people tend to remember. And it had absolutely nothing to do with Cuba or submarines, and actually generally little to do with the Soviet Union at all. To understand this particular side story and the long complicated mess of CIA assassinations, dog astronauts, proxy wars, uh, psychological experimentation, and everything else that was the Cold War, we have to travel about 2,000 miles northwest to Duluth, Minnesota. On the night of October 25th, 1962, at a now defunct Air Force base in Minnesota, a guard at the direction center saw a large figure trying to enter the base. We have an intruder! How did he get in? Intruder window? Bye bye! He raised an alarm and shot at the would be intruder, who then promptly ran away on all fours. Now, I live in a place where we get black bears all the time. From far away and at night, I can completely understand mistaking them for a very tall person. They even walk on the soles of their feet like people do, unlike the tips of their toes like cats, dogs, and most mammals out there. A bear walking upright, which they do pretty often, can look pretty normal, albeit a bit drunk. Which, seeing as he thought this bear was a Soviet spy, yeah, that kind of checks out. It wasn't too long before the guard realized his mistake. Tensions were running quite high, higher than they ever had before, and it's hard to blame him for being overly cautious given the circumstances. Because of the events going on at the time around Cuba, all of the military bases in the United States were currently on alert DEFCON 3, basically one of the highest alerts they could possibly be on. Everyone was expecting intruders. They had been briefed by higher-ups in the military to expect Soviet saboteurs to sneak onto military bases and other strategic places in the United States, planting bombs, doing other minor acts of sabotage, and such acts would precede the actual raining nukes from the sky that everyone was expecting to happen any day now. If you think that was a silly thing for them to have been worried about, war was pretty different back then. And a lot of it was done by individual undercover saboteurs. And you can watch my video here talking about some specific German saboteurs who blew up New York City uh, before we had even joined the war in 1916. So there was every reason to believe they were actually under attack. But no, for as much as the Soviets love to train animals for their war effort, and I might make a video in the future about their uh, spy dolphins and other such plots. This particular black bear was no such undercover operative. Unless... So that was the end of the story. In Minnesota, at least. Moving south about 240 miles to Camp Douglas, Wisconsin. And that alarm the guard sounded up in Minnesota was causing problems. You see, when one military base raises an alarm, all of the surrounding military bases in that area are also sent similar alarms to be on high alert. So, Volk Field Air National Guard Base in Wisconsin received an alert. A different alert. The wrong one. The absolute very worst one. The alarm systems in this particular base had been recently rewired. And they had been rewired incorrectly. So that this 
there's an intruder on a different military base alarm did not sound. Instead, it set off the fireman bells throughout Volk Field, which, bonus fact, those fireman bells are called klaxon bells, which I didn't know that before researching this, so there you go. The klaxon bells, which alerted the pilots sleeping in their bunks at the time that the Soviets were on a bombing raid. A nuclear bombing raid. And again, this is the third day of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So they had every reason to believe this was a legitimate alarm. The Navy was at that very second blockading nuclear missiles from the Soviet Union from making it to Cuba, where those nuclear payloads would be set onto ICBMs and pointed at Miami. Everyone knew this. So this was a very believable alarm that they were already expecting to receive at any minute. So they got in their planes. What kind of planes? Well, these were pilots of F-106A interceptors, planes designed to seek and destroy nuclear weapons before they could actually hit the ground. And what was uh, the United States' decision at the time to destroy nukes in the air before they could hit the ground? Well, nukes, of course! So, you wanna fight fire with fire, huh? Magic missile! The Air-2 Genie was an air-to-air -air rocket carrying a 1.5 kiloton nuclear payload. That's about one-tenth the size of the bomb that destroyed the city of Hiroshima. That's quite big. But they were planning on shooting this bomb in the air, in the skies, above the United States, at a plane carrying even larger nukes. I don't know who they were thinking they were saving with this plan. I, I, I guess their idea was to have the nukes detonate over less populated areas, but still very much would detonate. But okay, this isn't all bad, right? Because they wouldn't actually find planes carrying nukes out there in the sky. The f alarm was a false alarm, right? Operation Chrome Dome lasted from 1960 to 1968, and during that time, planes flew in this pattern at all times. American planes carrying American nukes, never landing as they were refueled over the ocean by other planes mid flight, waiting to fly over the North Pole to carry their nuclear payloads and drop them on already pre-designated cities in the Soviet Union. So in short, yes, many, many nuclear-armed planes were already in the skies that night. Heading back to Wisconsin, I wish I could tell you the name of this epically unsung hero of the Cold War. Um, I imagine a lot of this is classified and uh, his name has not been released. Um, even the details I'm telling you weren't declassified for the next 25 years. An officer at Volk Field decided that th they would actually double-check the order to end all of human civilization by calling the military base who sent out this alarm. And after calling and confirming, yes, this was a false alarm. He drove his jeep on the runway in front of nuclear-armed planes flown by high-strung, overtired pilots who were trying to take off in front of him, flashed his headlights, and averted a disaster. All right, so you may still be thinking that I've been exaggerating. How could this incident, even if taken to its extreme, possibly have led to full nuclear annihilation of the world? Uh, because we still would not have been fighting the Soviet Union. Yes, it would have been a tragedy, but you'd think it would just have been an American tragedy and one of our own making. But that's not it. If you come with me on the journey of taking this comedy of errors to its logical extreme, keeping in mind that crazier sequences of coincidences have happened before, imagine this. A genie bomb is shot at an American bomber plane. A scarily likely opportunity that night in a sky full of high-strung, terrified pilots who had been told that there were enemies in the air. The other American bombers are signaled that one of their own is down, shot by a nuke, no less. And therefore, they would have no reason to question that that nuke was shot by the Soviets, and then go on their pre-designated flight paths over the North Pole. The idea of 
uh, the nuclear deterrent is the idea that we will never go to this war with the Soviet Union and they will never go to war with us, provided we have nukes, because cooler heads will always prevail if a war between the two of us means nuclear annihilation. Cooler heads were not always in charge, and we just got very lucky for a very long time. Oh hi, thanks for checking in. I'm still a piece of garbage. Here's a supposedly cheery message from Wikipedia. Many scholars have posited that a global thermonuclear war with Cold War era stockpiles, or even with the current smaller stockpiles, may lead to human extinction. This position was bolstered when nuclear winter was first conceptualized and modeled in 1983. However, models from the past decade would consider total extinction very unlikely and suggest parts of the world would remain habitable. Good. Total human extinction. Very unlikely. Some places would remain habitable. In America, we tend to make things about ourselves, but in reality, the Soviet nukes were not pointed at American cities, maybe Alaska. In general, they couldn't reach our country. We could reach them. We had military bases in Turkey, and from there, our ICBMs we had set up were pointing nukes directly at Moscow. And not just Moscow either, but basically every major capital in the entire Iron Curtain was threatened with not just our nukes, but again, people forget, other countries were involved in the Cold War as well, and England, and majorly France. France really liked their nukes. People forget that. <laughs> France was the country that went the longest testing their nukes, uh, long after the rest of the country signed treaties to never test atmospheric nukes ever again. They were just casually bombing Algeria. This is the thing that caused the Cuban Missile Crisis to begin with. That's the situation. We were only scared when they were nuking us, not our European allies. So this is why the Cuban Missile Crisis mattered so much. The ICBMs they had could hit major population centers for the first time. The Cold War finally became real for many people who it was just a meme that we'd go to school and learn the duck and cover song, right? This was now, oh, they can really nuke us any second, and those missiles are here now. So people knew what putting those nukes on Cuba truly meant. And that brings us full circle back to Duluth, Minnesota, and a bear just trying to pack away some military rations before winter. Bears are not true hibernators. There are frog species that freeze entirely before thawing out in the spring. There are rodents whose heart rates decrease to around three beats per minute but somehow stay alive. And despite waking up once or twice uh, for a mid-season snack, bears are one of the most well-adapted animals to surviving the harsh Minnesota winters. I can't imagine this bear ever understood that it almost caused a different kind of winter entirely. One thing that no animal is specially adapted to survive. <laughs> this has been History Science Theater. Magic missile! Except it all! All righty then, moving in front of the camera to hopefully be in focus. Yes. Good? Okay. I'm the only one here, so I don't have someone checking to make sure the camera's in focus, so I gotta move to make sure it focuses on me. <sighs> I might keep that in, put it at the end of the video.